So this evening, um, we'll be talking about social infrastructure, uh, a particular theme we consider to be uh, important. Uh, we, we're not the only ones. You may have heard this morning uh, uh, Emmanuel Moulin, the French Director General of Treasury, highlighting the importance of uh, social infrastructure like healthcare for the, uh, the, the policy and the, the sustainable development in France and elsewhere. So <laughs> before we dive in into the substance, uh, I'd like for us to take a few minutes to uh, introduce our fellow panelists, or rather ask them uh, to introduce themselves. So uh, maybe ladies first, uh, uh, Charlotte, if you want to get started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Charlotte Lavidotfort. After 10 years uh, as head of financing within the bank of the Credit Mutual Healthcare Group, I've been uh, recently joining uh, Shell Chopin Gestion, the asset management uh, uh, French uh, firm um, to um, uh, firm of the group, uh, as head of the um, mandate management uh, for the newly created infrastructure transition platform. Cathy? Okay. My name is Katie Grenemann. I am an associate at the member relations team at GRESB. Uh, for, you, for those of you who don't know, GRESB is the global uh, benchmark for, uh, for real assets when it comes to ESG. And uh, I've been with GRESB for two years and uh, working on uh, our mission to create a sustainable uh, world uh, by uh, working on new real assets. Good, good afternoon. I'm Eric Meyer. Uh, I am a managing director of Thomas. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I'm Eric Meyer. I'm a managing director of uh, Royal Bank of Canada in Paris. Yes. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> so, third time lucky. <laughs> so, Eric Meyer, managing director for Royal Bank of Canada in Paris for France. I've uh, been uh, with the bank for six years now. Uh, was previously at JP Morgan and Société Générale for quite a few years, so quite active in the French market, and Royal Bank of Canada is obviously a substantial and significant actor in uh, infrastructure at large and social infrastructure in particular. Good afternoon. My name is Geoffrey Lévesque, and I'm a, a lawyer. I'm a counsel at uh, CMS Francis Lefebvre Law Firm, and I'm uh, in charge of project finance, and as such, I'm... Uh, very much involved in uh, infrastructure and uh, renewable energy. So maybe let me first take uh, one or two minutes to explain to you why we selected this particular theme of social infrastructure, which was not addressed in previous editions of the uh, Paris Infra Week inaugural forum. Uh, and I take responsibility for this because I, I initially was the one who suggested uh, this team to the Paris Europlus uh, organizing committee. Uh, we at LTIA have just uh, uh, well, finalized a, a report on social infrastructure from challenge to opportunity to investors uh, trying to uh, identify and, uh, <coughs> the drivers and come up with uh, some proposals or suggestions as to how to effectively uh, scale up investment and in particular investment from private investors in, in social infrastructure. And, and why do we think this is important? Well, <laughs> overall, uh, some of you may know, uh, the stock of social infrastructure, a, a key dimension, by the way, of uh, sustainability, uh, um, there's a, a, a trend now in economics, uh, uh, putting human capital as the, uh, the key driver for sustainability, productivity of uh, uh, societies, and underpinning human capital, of course, you would find uh, social infrastructure. But that, as it happens, social infrastructure has lagged behind uh, in advanced economies, uh, uh, as well, of course, as in uh, emerging economies. Uh, uh, the, 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 the rate of investment in social infrastructure has never really picked up after the global financial crisis 10 years ago, contrary to economic infrastructure. Uh, so it has indeed uh, generated what we could call a chronic undersupply of social infrastructure, <coughs> uh, which was highlighted during the COVID crisis uh, with regard to uh, well, sectors like healthcare, uh, education, or social affordable housing, uh, when uh, those um, type of infrastructure was submitted to uh, unprecedented uh, challenging circumstances. <coughs> So traditionally, this is a sector funded mostly by 
financed and funded mostly by the, uh, the public uh, uh, sector, government pay business model, but we've seen uh, over time uh, a uh, participation from uh, private investors, private financiers, bank, uh, equity funds uh, that have shown that it is indeed possible to uh, invest from the private sector standpoint, uh, but there are a number of challenges uh, to overcome if we are to scale up uh, <coughs> significantly. So today, um, to, to try and address this, we'll, we'll start maybe with a, a, a particular angle, which is both a a potentially a driver for investors to invest more in social infrastructure and a bit of a challenge because not always easy to, to measure. And I'm referring to the, uh, the uh, social dimension in the ESG, the S in ESG. One could think that, uh, uh, well, social infrastructure uh, fares particularly well with regard to this S factor in ESG. And, and we'd like to, to hear more about this, whether or not uh, indeed there is a... a, 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 a perfect alignment, let's say, between social infrastructure and the social dimension of ESG. So um, to, to, to get the ball rolling, um, let's start with uh, uh, the ladies in our uh, board. And by the way, I can see that we have gender parity, which was not always the case in previous uh, panels. Maybe it's the social dimension, who knows? Uh, women have a maybe more developed social uh, uh, dimension than men. Anyway, Kathy, uh, over to you. What, how do you do you characterize the, the, the challenges linked with the S dimension in, in social infrastructure? Yeah, um, there are definitely uh, many, many dimensions to social infrastructure because obviously social infrastructure is also not a monolith. It's got hospitals in it, it's got student accommodation, uh, we even count uh, governance buildings, uh, defense barracks, everything. Um, so there are lots of different social dynamics at play there and, and lots of different social factors to take into account when it comes to uh, sustainability and ES and G. Uh, so just to clarify, in our assessments, we measure uh, the sustainability performance of reporting assets, and we benchmark that. But we use a materiality assessment to do so. So we factor in certain things um, before scoring an asset. And, and we've recently published our results, so I'll refer to that a little bit as well when, I, when I'm mentioning certain numbers. Uh, and what we find this year is that our social infrastructure assets do really well when it comes to governance. Um, they're weighted a bit more heavily on the social factors because they're so important in measuring the sustainability performance. But actually there's a bit of a, a lag against the overall infrastructure universe that reports to GRESB. So there's definitely a little room for improvement for those uh, social infrastructure assets. And uh, on the one hand, that's maybe also a COVID related uh, pattern, you know, things not being prioritized this year or last year because other things were far more important, which is completely understandable. Um, but it also shows that maybe there's a little jump to be made to catch up to the overall universe. And especially when it comes to the environmental dimension, not to forget that because um, social infrastructure has a massive impact on surrounding communities and that has social dimensions, but also uh, a lot of environmental dimensions. Think of uh, you know, uh, energy use, uh, uh, lots of cars driving around, people visiting the hospital. Uh, if, if you have a hospital, for example. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of dimensions to take into account and, and it's important not to, to overlook that, but to take the whole picture holistically, uh, which is what we try to do at GRESB. Thank you, and, and we'll revisit this because obviously this social dimension could be both a, a driver for uh, investors that are keen to burnish their ESG credentials, but it could be also a, a repetitional issue for some of them that are a bit uh, shy about uh, taking on this kind of risk. Um, Charlotte, uh, over to you now. You, you, you just told us you, you launched uh, recently uh, an infrastructure debt platform. Uh, what are you doing in the field of social infrastructure and what will be your plans? Um, faced with the challenge of the social transition, uh, Shell Chaperon Gestion has just created a new uh, expertise in infrastructure debt uh, by targeting a global impact. Um, since many years, the ESG dimension is incorporated in the, uh, in the uh, performance and the uh, way we, we do our financing on asset management uh, uh, activities. Uh, last year, the Credit Mutuel Arkea adopted its raison d'etre uh, to address the uh, social, society and uh, economic development, uh, to, uh, to take a long-term view, uh, to have a, a major uh, social and environmental uh, um, impact on the uh, challenging facing our 
activities. Uh, that's why last September we uh, created the uh, infrastructure transition platform, a new expertise of uh, infrastructure debt management. Effectively, traditionally within the Credit Mutual Care Group, the uh, um, uh, infrastructure financing was provided by the bank activity. Uh, with this new uh, uh, activity, we want to uh, leverage our th the strength of the group and to address um, all the type of the transition in the infrastructure sector. We have today uh, um, a portfolio under management, 500 million euros, uh, which comprise 30% of social infrastructure assets within uh, this uh, portfolio, uh, mainly education projects, universities, colleges, uh, security project, as you mentioned, uh, social infrastructure is quite uh, uh, diversified. Uh, police station building, for instance, all also cultural assets such as uh, arena uh, or sport equipment or public building. Uh, with this new activity, our ambition is to offer investors the opportunity to become with us major player in the European energy, digital, environmental, of, of course, social uh, transition. And this is my last point. Uh, we target with this uh, activity a global impact. Uh, we are determined to uh, ensure a high level of compliance of our funds with the uh, new uh, EU taxonomy regulation um, with uh, Article 8 and Article 9 uh, funds uh, under the disclosure regulation. Uh, today, only green buildings could uh, comply with this regulation. Uh, that means building, uh, achieving um, very high standard of um, a recognized r standard for green buildings such as BREEAM or LEED, but also building uh, having effect in terms of energy saving or uh, better performance in terms of uh, uh, energy generation. Um, we have, for instance, in our portfolio, one asset which uh, uh, where investment was made on an existing public building for um, a sport equipment uh, to improve energy efficiency and uh, with an objective to achieve a performance of 40% energy saving. And this is typically the type of assets uh, we target uh, in uh, social infrastructure um, uh, activities. So, Eric, uh, now uh, from on behalf of the Royal Bank of Canada, your bank has been very active in those uh, markets in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, I been, believe you've been in the top five lenders, uh, social infrastructure, healthcare over the recent period. Could you tell us what uh, are your uh, your sort of your, your business uh, drivers and what what kind of uh, uh, approach do you have? Is, is there a particular business model you uh, you favour in terms of uh, uh, availability payment, funding by the government, or, or rather purely private type of facilities? Now, thank you, Francois. Well, first of all, different markets get, you know, they get different responses. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, social infrastructure is, is definitely part of RBC's social contract. Uh, historically, we at home in Canada have pioneered the financing of social, social infrastructure via the market. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, the long-term bank market has almost evaporated versus the bond market. Uh, and RBC has, uh, is the largest issue. We've got about 50% market share in Canada. So that's strong. And this has proven a very flexible and very useful instrument to, to channel uh, private money, uh, institutional money, into social infrastructures, be they DBFM, be they DBF, uh, or others. Um, in other jurisdictions, uh, things are different. In the US, which is by far our largest market globally. Uh, the municipal uh, financing market is a, is a thing in part and basically takes, you know, takes all the oxygen of, uh, <laughs> of financing there, so no need to, to say again. But, but there is indeed a paradox, uh, if you will, because as, as you put it rightly, you know, there's a lot of E's, there's a lot of G, and not enough S in ESG. Uh, there's a huge you know, pent-up demand. Uh, the infrastructure demographics favor, obviously, the, the social dimension of infrastructure, uh, there is uh, all this, this, so after a, you know, a long lull, I mean, there, is, there are some other trends. I mean, first of all, you know, the energy retrofit, you know, greening, uh, but as well, lots of money around. So why is it that it hasn't been as, as you know, we haven't seen as much money uh, channeled through that? I think you, you touched upon it. I mean, uh, there may be some reputational issues, 
some issues that investors are slightly wary of being associated with a project that may go wrong uh, for whatever reason. Uh, on sustainability linked products, uh, projects, sorry, uh, what you have is that you find it very difficult to find the right KPI to abide to, and that's another additional risk that you don't want. So all of that has basically created, you know, a dearth of, um, of private money towards that that, uh, that is hard to, uh, hard to mix. And to finally answer the question, we at RBC in Europe uh, are definitely more focused on private, you know, uh, finding private money uh, and private project. And what we have seen is in a lot of situations, and, and it's a pity, um, you find that it is easier to finance a social infrastructure product through classic leverage finance or LBO financing than it is with, uh, with project finance, what was traditional things, because it's less cumbersome. Now, I'll take advantage of us having a, a lawyer uh, on board this panel with uh, Geoffrey Lévesque to, to ask him uh, what kind of uh, uh, aspects differentiate from the, the legal or, or regulatory standpoint uh, assets or investment in social infrastructure from other uh, segments in infrastructure. What are the, uh, the specifics that may explain uh, the current situation which we started to, uh, to cover? Um, yeah, first of all, I must say I'm a, I'm a transactional lawyer, not a regulatory lawyer, so um, I'm not going to look into the, the, the various, uh, you know, taxonomy ESG. Obviously, it's, in, uh, it's impacting us on the transaction, but I guess we, we, we all share the, the, the same uh, statement and the, the fact that there is um, a shortage of deals, of green, green, uh, green, uh, you know, green transaction, new deals, basically, on the social infrastructure market. Uh, and so, as you know, as somebody working on transaction, either I can turn towards Brownfield, and you know, there is actually some appetite, which shows that there is money on the market, or uh, you know, uh, try and analyze uh, the, the issues that we are facing on the, on the social infrastructure market to uh, to develop new new, new infrastructure. So, uh, I guess looking at that uh, and trying to assess the situation and find solution, uh, you know, on the French market, which is a market I know I know the most. Uh, I think we can identify three, three, three main issues, and, and that probably uh, explain in a bit uh, the, the difficulties we have in France to, you know, to basically uh, um, uh, find a link between uh, the, the, the investors who are really willing to invest more money in the social infrastructure, and on the other hand, the, the, the need for new uh, and refurbished infrastructure. So I, I guess we I've identified uh, three of those. Maybe there is a uh, a kind of political or uh, philosophical debate as to uh, uh, whether or not uh, PPP is, is a good thing to develop social infrastructure. Uh, I guess it's not uh, so much the, the lens of, of the contract itself, which is in itself seen as a problem, but probably the fact that uh, when entering into a, a marché de partenariat, um, a public authority is committing to uh, to make payment for, for, for a very long period of, of time, sometimes 20 years when it comes to school or universities. And, and, and it goes obviously beyond, uh, you know, the, um, the, the life cycle of a political person. So, so basically when you're a mayor and, you know, you're, you're, you're choosing this type of scheme, you're committing uh, your mairie uh, for, for, for many, many years, and it's sometimes a problem. And, I mean, in terms of solution, we've, we've seen recently... Uh, uh, something which looks, um, I mean, which is working for some social infrastructure, but not for all of, the, all of them, uh, which is called, I mean, the concession, concession à la française is, is you know, something uh, well known in France, but those innovative in, uh, concession uh, where basically uh, you have, uh, you know, private investor financing the development or the refurbishment of new buildings, for example, and getting the right, uh, you know, to, to, to rent those infrastructure uh, to the public authorities and to other person, and that's developing. So, so maybe it's of interest to our, our, our fellow investors and, 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 and bankers because it's really something we see on the market. There is a legal uh, issue hurdle as well, which we we've seen recently, uh, especially in a, uh, in in the PPP scheme in, in relation to uh, uh, to schools in Marseille, where. Uh, you know, when you're entering into a marché de partenariat, you, have, you basically have to demonstrate from the very beginning uh, that this marché de partenariat is, uh, uh, is better than basically um, getting the, the job done yourself, and you need to, to demonstrate a fa favorable evaluation. And, and that's apparently uh, something difficult for the, you know, the procuring authority. 
And um, in that respect, maybe um, we, can, we could go back to a more sectorial approach rather than the, a global approach for the existing set of rules. Uh, and, and, and basically, when times come for uh, call for a major investment in uh, social infrastructure, uh, energy efficiency, to, to go back to a more uh, sectoral approach, where basically the, same, the, set, the set of rules are a bit softened uh, to allow for, for swift investment. And, and lastly, and probably uh, one we're going to touch upon a, a little bit later, uh, one of the major issues for, for international investors in, in that market is that basically they want to invest big tickets, something like uh, 100 million euro rather than uh, you know 10 of, or 15 million euro, and, and that the size uh, of the investment for, for one single asset is a bit too small for, in the, for the investors. And, and again, in that respect, we, we've seen a um, new scheme develop, developing in, in the market, uh, so-called uh, um, framework agreement, basically, um, Accord Cadre, uh, whereby a public authority can bundle projects and grant them to one, uh, one bidder, uh, which will uh, in, therefore have uh, you know, the, the, the scale and the size of, of the investment that it's looking for. Uh, and that's, that can be a win-win situation as well. So, um, Indy Jeffrey, you've already uh, touched upon one of the, uh, the, the key points uh, in this discussion, which is that, uh, uh, well, 10 or 15 years ago, probably we would have uh, put our hope in the, the development of PPP programs or PFI in the UK to uh, foster the development and the channeling of private investment into social infrastructure. Uh, as we all know, uh, this wave is now sort of uh, declining, if, if not uh, completely stopped in, in some jurisdictions. So, indeed, the, uh, the sort of PPP approach, uh, relying on a direct agreement with a procuring authority and some kind of uh, availability payment by the, uh, the, the, the public off-taker, seems to have somehow reached its limits. So what, what kind of other uh, schemes can we think of? And maybe to, to get the, the discussion uh, sort of started, uh, have you had, and I'm, I'm specifically uh, asking these questions to our, our bankers or debt finances, have you had in your past experience um, successful instances of uh, being able to effectively crowd in, let's say, private equity investor along you uh, in the kind of uh, projects or assets that you were financing? And if so, under which type of uh, uh, contractual scheme? Uh, was it some kind of, as uh, Geoffrey said, a concession with public subsidies or uh, any other uh, sort of uh, <coughs> bespoke uh, type of uh, agreement? In other words, uh, have you uh, effectively experimented uh, other ways to uh, try and take on board the, 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 the private investors, the institutional investors, which we, we know are, are, for most of them, are keen to put more money into social infrastructure, but bump into this uh, type of obstacle. So Charlotte, any instance or example or, or views about how to, 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 to effectively take them on board? Uh, yes, effectively, the, the question of having a, a program uh, and with a, a portfolio of projects is one, one, one of the answers possible because uh, it gives visibility to the investor and to the, to the financier to, well, to invest in a structure and uh, to understand the, the projects. Uh, this was what has been done, for instance, in the saint saint department with a, a school program for uh, at least 20 schools. Uh, 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 half of it was done under PPP program, uh, bundling the, um, the project three or four school to have a minimum uh, size of assets uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, attracting uh, private uh, investors and private uh, banks. Um, but for instance, this, this is uh, linked, I think, to a, a strong political will because uh, you have to, uh, to face, as Jeffrey mentioned, well, uh, political obstacles or difficulties. Um, on today, uh, today the, the new program of schools for the same department is done under contrat de performance without any financing. So we, we, we don't have the, the right solution, at least in France, I think, uh, for, for this type of, uh, of um, well, way to, to scale up investment and to attract the f uh, private uh, financier. And indeed, the marché de performance do not either transfer the, the maîtrise d'ouvrage, the, uh, the capacity, responsibility for the uh, overall uh, uh, 
uh, good uh, implementation of the project. Any views on your side based on maybe other markets than the French market and what mm. can effectively work to uh, crowd in investors? I, indeed. I mean, what, what typically investors don't like too much is combos. Uh, and, and a kind of combination of, of things that are kind of hybrids of uh, half one or another, and that's, that has proven very difficult in the past to basically try to imagine something where you bring in private investor uh, to basically be in the same bed as, uh, as the states in when, when things are not completely uh, well defined. Uh, so it's work in progress. Uh, as you know, as, as I told you uh, earlier, I mean, what you have seen is that the, the LBO market or private equity investors have taken on on the number of investment that you would qualify as social infrastructure, be it in education, be it in healthcare, retirement homes, or those. And you can see that there is a lot of money that floods you know, into, into those, and that works perfectly, perfectly fine. So really, the, the regime of the concession is, is a great one. What you see, obviously, in, in the UK and Germany is more flexibility. Uh, one of the difficulty is permitting or licensing and predictability of, of growth. And that is something that is limiting. So, Francois, not, not any specific example, but challenges that need to be overcome. And I'll, I'll echo uh, Charlotte's comment on uh, scalability, mm -hmm. a big issue. And, you know, maybe 20 schools in Saint-Saint-Denis will we'll do it in France. To bring in international investors, you need 200 schools. Mm -hmm. And 200 schools mean 20 departments or have, and you have like Département, la région, la municipalité, l'État, and, and this is sandwich of, of I mean, investors the, making the, the school dimension may be easier to manage, at least in France, because we have the, some kind of specific uh, responsibilities yeah. at different level of subnational governments, uh, yeah. lycée for the région or the, the college for the département. Uh, hospitals or healthcare facilities are a different story altogether, you, usually uh, on a more sort of single object basis. Yeah. Uh, and overall, again, I mean, as we, 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 we started by saying that the, the, the heart of the problem is that 95% today of social infrastructure in the EU is still publicly financed, publicly funded, and, and we know there's not much more than the public sector can do. They're already overstretched, they're facing growing uh, public deficit or public debt constraints. So this issue of uh, um, well, making sure the private sector can play a bigger role is not just an intellectual uh, uh, sort of question. It's really about uh, uh, unlocking uh, the, the kind of uh, additional resources we need if we are to uh, ensure a fair transition, maintain social cohesion, and make sure the the the, the, the sustain well the, the development model we opt for is a sustainable one. But Francois, there are some so there are some success nevertheless. So we shouldn't be too too much doomsayers. And if you look at the Palais de Justice. For example, I mean that works fine. Indeed, uh, but uh, I'm it, it belonged to a wave that may have already that peaked is right. a that few is right. years ago. That is right. uh, maybe coming back, Kathy, uh, uh, to this, um, uh, well, the kind of uh, drivers that may push uh, investors, private investors, to put more money into social infrastructure. So, so we we mentioned the, uh, the, the the sort of ESG credentials. Uh, uh, we are now on the verge of an important new uh, step or milestone when it comes to the uh, EU taxonomy, which until now has focused more on the uh, E dimension. Uh, the next step should be normally to uh, address the other dimension, starting with S. How do you see this? And uh, how, what can be the, the contribution of, uh, uh, of Grasby in that respect? And do you anticipate that it may serve as a, a sort of an additional uh, a driver to, to foster or nudge private investors to, put, to do more in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's, uh, it's about time to, that the EU taxonomy caught up to speed. I would love to say to you, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen, but it's it's the EU, so I don't I don't know. <laughs> um, it's in draft form at the moment, the the social uh, social uh, infra the social taxonomy. So um, what it looks like is it will probably try to maximize positive outcomes, um, but that means in terms of social aspects, probably community engagement, things like that. So sort of topics that really are very close, I think, to social infrastructure. Uh, and, and focusing uh, uh, on, on really doing no significant harm, I think, is, is, is a different thing for social infrastructure than it is, for example, for an energy uh, or power plant. 
uh, what GRASP can contribute to that really is ultimately, if you wanna show your performance, you gotta measure it, right? You need to be able to put the numbers behind the words. Uh, and that's what I think GRASP is, is really good at is that we facilitate that. So we have that sort of structured way of reporting the data, benchmarking that as well. So having an understanding of how you stack up against other similar assets. And, and I think that's really where we can contribute and that's also what we wanna contribute uh, towards. Uh, but for the time being, we are watching the space like hawks and trying to make sure that, you know, once uh, once Brussels figures things out, we are ready to, to go effectively and to support our, uh, our members with the transition as well. So one takeaway we came up with with this uh, report, which by the way will be made available from uh, tonight or tomorrow morning, uh, first hour, uh, on our website so, uh, and, and will be uh, uh, disseminated through social media as well. One of the uh, takeaways is that uh, short of uh, a, a sufficient deal flow of uh, projects in the uh, social infrastructure field uh, regarding new projects, greenfield projects, most of the activity of uh, institutional investors over the last uh, five to 10 years has been concentrated on the secondary market. Uh, in other words, buying existing assets, sometimes extending it, modernizing or retrofitting it, but mostly, uh, again, not adding directly to the stock of existing assets. So my, my, my question to, uh, to our financiers is, is that, are you comfortable with uh, that type of uh, financing? Uh, uh, do you consider it's a sort of a necessary stepping stone before we can effectively uh, address a more ambitious uh, greenfield program? Or, or, or would you rather ideally uh, uh, fund or finance more uh, new deals rather than uh, existing assets? How do you see it? Well, I, I think we can address uh, both, both issues. Um, uh, effectively, there is a large stock of assets uh, in the brownfield sector, and we can be um, we can refinance. This is also the occasion to uh, to improve the uh, energy efficiency or social usage of the buildings. Many it's buildings, uh, so it's uh, it's not only refinancing; it's also an increase in capex uh, to serve better the, the well the service and the uh, the usage of the building. So that's going to be uh, well. Uh, revamping and renovation of existing social infrastructure and this is one possibility but there you need uh, to have the question of stability and kind of standardization um, but there is also uh, a need for a new uh, new asset as you mentioned in the greenfield sector and and today for instance within our strategy we want to have an, an impact uh, according to the European taxonomy and today, having an impact is only based on environmental uh, criteria, as mentioned by Cathy. So if we can include social um, uh, criteria, social impact, KPI, KPI impact in the, in the uh, regulation, the EU taxonomy, I think it, it can increase uh, broadly uh, the type of uh, assets that the investor can, uh, can address. And, um, and uh, uh, you may have also two dimensions in this uh, investment. First, the uh, environmental uh, dimension linked to the energy uh, efficiency of the building, and then also the social uh, social um, service uh, uh, provided by the building. So it's a, a, a double uh, scale uh, um, impact. Uh, so I think it could be a very bit, um, profitable for the uh, the uh, ability to attract uh, private uh, financier in the in the social infrastructure sector, which is, as you mentioned, uh, well, a sector where in investment is huge. It's a kind of the third wave of uh, uh, investment needed in Europe, and uh, uh, we need to well to address all the issues uh, of the of the market. Eric, any views on on this? No, I would tend to to echo Charlotte's comment. Uh, yeah, there's a huge, there's a huge demand, there's a huge need. Whether it's effectively retrofit, whether it's uh, uh, green, you know, greening the, the project, all that. It's a, it's a smart way to bring uh, investment in, uh, in projects that are well dimensioned, that are well known. Uh, the key challenge is KPIs. The key challenge is how do you define? And uh, you get investors; they must, they must feel comfortable that they will be able to measure without, well, that they can master. Uh, the KPI by which uh, the social dimension will be will be measured, and that is 
that is that is the issue. But apart from that, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a way to bring in uh, private money in the project, and that's a, as a stepping stone to maybe hopefully further uh, further opportunities for green growth. So, in, in previous panels, we've talked a lot about the uh, the potential of blended finance to help make some type of uh, projects more bankable or uh, provide more incentives to, to private investors to effectively join the action, whether it's in emerging markets or some more challenging environments. Uh, how, how do you see that the role of um, uh, blended finance, and I, I, I'm referring specifically here maybe to the kind of uh, uh, upfront guarantees or subsidies that may uh, need to go for a, a social infrastructure project. Is it for you a, a key element in uh, making up your, your final decision to go or not to go for a particular project? Would you expect some kind of involvement from Public Development Bank, for example, as a, uh, a sort of guarantee that the project is effectively fit for your risk profile? Is it? I think, again, I mean, uh, there, is, there is a political risk, and that's what, what typically investor hate, uh, and the risk of change of mind, change of heart throughout. So. The more guarantees about, about or that you can have up front about that is is important. Uh, the more visibility that, you know, talking about the KPIs or whatever you want to measure your investment against uh, is is not going to change or slide or or be different five years from now. That's that's very important. And one has to note that you know, social investment, but I mean ESG in general, uh, the the advantage in cost that you get out of that is not huge mm. today. And the reality is that you know the financing of, uh, advantage for an ESG project is what maybe five bips, at best, in a project. So, so in some ways, you you have to find ways to make this financing advantage more palatable, to bring more people from other projects. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Maybe a, a, another question more directed to our financiers, uh, and it's linked with the uh, sort of subsectoral approach to social infrastructure. So we, we've put healthcare a bit on the front uh, as it's a sort of a uh, sector that comes naturally to mind when talking about social infrastructure, but there, there are a lot of other segments, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, well, care in more general, senior care or, or facilities, uh, education, of course, student housing, uh, social affordable housing, this type of uh, segments that may maybe uh, carry less sort of a reputational risk than investing in a hospital uh, and may have less regulatory constraints attached to them. Uh, do you have, uh, as, a, as a bank, a, a sort of uh, ranking of preferences uh, in terms of which sectors are more comfortable, let's say, for you to uh, effectively get in uh, and, and which sector you would rather reserve for further developments once you are higher in the experience curve? So I would respond as an asset manager. <laughs> Never, I'm not, not a, a banker anymore. Um, well, I, I think each uh, subsector of social infrastructure has its own merits and, uh, and difficulties so that, uh, well, our, our um, approach is to, uh, to have a uh, well, deep due diligence and uh, analysis of all the risk, it can be reputational, payment risk, uh, well, as, as, com as the opposite to economic infrastructure, generally you, you rely on the public sector, uh, uh, subsidy, payment, rent, any, any kind of uh, public support, uh, which can help uh, the global risk appreciation of the, uh, of the project. Um, when you you have also um, user revenues, uh, well, the question is how uh, you can quantify this uh, user revenues and uh, is this uh, well uh, um, uh, taken into account in your uh, risk uh, or credit analysis? Uh, so I think yeah, well, there is no one general answer. I think we have to address each set uh, with its own uh, uh, specificity. This is, uh, well, the beauty of project finance, in fact, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, well, to, to work on a case-by-case, -case, uh, but uh, uh, typically um, new technology risk is something uh, project finance does not, do not like a lot. Um, uh, political risk uh, has to be, uh, well, to be organized, but uh, sometimes difficult to, uh, to address also, 
uh, but there is also very uh, well strong um, uh, forces in the uh, in this sector. Uh, the global uh, uh, credit risk is, is that essential assets uh, that provide a service, and we've seen during the COVID-19 crisis that uh, these assets has been continuing uh, operational, and uh, and uh, this is a very resilient asset. So, uh, with all these um, uh, str str strong um, uh, strong uh, points, you can uh, you can uh, um, organize a uh, structural financing that is. Uh, uh, acceptable for uh, for investors and for uh, um, for asset managers, I think. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we're getting closer to the end of our time slot, so let, let me maybe try to wrap up briefly uh, some of the issues that we touched upon during this uh, session. I think we have identified a number of challenges or specific constraints that. Uh, probably currently limit the, the, the size and the expansion potential of social infrastructure as a, a, an asset class for investors, whether it's the limited pipeline of uh, new greenfield projects, uh, reputational risk issues for some investors in, uh, in the kind of uh, uh, projects that have a, have a higher uh, public opinion profile and hospitals come to mind. Uh, the small asset size, uh, typically the fact that a, a, a school or a hospital is a much smaller asset than a, a motorway, an airport, or a, a, a power station, and may stay below the radar screen, below the radar screen for many institutional investors. Uh, uh, the difficulty to assess the, uh, the S dimension, which should naturally uh, uh, be attached to um, social infrastructure assets, and uh, we, we've mentioned without uh, really... Uh, uh, diving deeper, some uh, regulatory issues which may also uh, limit uh, access or political or philosophical uh, uh, dimension that may limit the, the private a sector access to, uh, to a social infrastructure. So a number of challenges, but uh, uh, I think for every challenges, you could think of a, a potential uh, uh, well, solution, or at least proposal, to help address and overcome these challenges. You'll find uh, some of those uh, recommendations or suggestions in our report, uh, whether it's about uh, uh, developing or recycling existing assets by procuring authorities, bundling projects, uh, um, making having a more active stewardship uh, from uh, uh, institutional investors to uh, make sure the ESG dimension is fully taken care of, uh, um, come going for more innovative uh, contractual schemes uh, to uh, overcome uh, limits or issues uh, linked with previous uh, contractual PPP schemes, for example. Uh, so uh, I can only encourage you to uh, have a quick look at it. It will be disseminated from, uh, from tomorrow, and uh, I hope we keep well, we hope to keep this uh, debate lively. Uh, there's certainly a need for more, uh, well, thought-provoking and brainstorming on how to scale up uh, investment in social infrastructure. With that, I suggest we give a round of applause to our panelists. And uh, <laughs>